On this episode of Throwback Thursday, Maxwell Ivey shares his journey through working paycheck to paycheck. Enjoy. What, what I want to do now is, is you worked there for three years in this automated collections, and then you decide to go back to the carnival and work with your family. And when you get back there, it's like you kind of reestablish what's going on and share with me in that 10 year window what happens. Right. So uh, I finally got to the point with the IRS where it just was, was the, the, the impact on my health was no longer worth what they were paying me for it. And I basically said, you know, I can live from check to check at home and be a lot happier than I am here. And my only real regret uh, when I left the IRS, it, I had, there's two things I did wrong. One is I had never worked for an employer before, so I didn't know that uh, that if you quit without taking your leave, they get to keep it. So I should have taken my leave and then quit. And I would have, would have had money coming in for another probably five or six months. The other thing is, is when I was at the IRS, I had really good credit. So I wish I had taken, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had went to the bank and borrowed some money to buy a carnival ride with before I left. I, I wish I had done that too. That would have been smart. That would have been really smart. That would have been smart. Well, I live and learn, it. right? Yeah, I live and learn. So I, so I go back and I joined the carnival, I back up with the carnival. As I say, I, I, I could, I felt like either way, if, if it comes down to a choice between, between being happy or unhappy and pretty much being in the same shape financially, I'd rather be happy. So I went back, stayed with the family. Um, I bought a used game trailer from my brother that he was uh, no longer needing because he had bought a better one. And I'm telling you, this was a glorified piece of junk. It was a wood frame trailer with sheet metal. And uh, once a year, the axles would come off of it and we'd have to reconnect the box to the axles. But oh my word. Uh, yeah, we had a we had a, a lucky a pick 'em up duck game and a and a tag balloon game in it, and that that raggedy old trailer made me a lot of money over a lot of years in the carnival business. Um, after, but uh, I was I was I did the bookings, so I did a lot of cold calling, and in fact, doing the cold calling with my dad is where I came up with one of my my most well known catchphrases, which is, "If you don't ask, they can't say yes." Because you see, we were a small carnival. We were seven, eight, sometimes nine rides in Texas, competing against carnivals with two or three times as many rides as we had with newer, flashier, scarier equipment than we owned. So the only way we could get bookings was to find people who didn't have enough, didn't have anybody else so they would take us. And that meant making a lot of phone calls and getting told no a lot. And every so often I would complain and I'd go, uh -uh, dad, I don't wanna do this no more. And he would go, if you don't ask, they can't say yes. Now stop complaining about it and call that next number I give you. Um, Excellent but, advice. Oh yeah, I like but it. The, yeah, but this is you know before real computers, or at least before you know having a portable computer with speech was something pretty common. Uh, I was keeping all my notes on a Perkins Braille writer, and oh my. yeah, I mean I had sheets and sheets of Braille paper with numbers I had called. Last you know, if you had an open week, you just started going back through all that paper and trying to figure out, was well, there somebody, you know, maybe somebody. Um, so I did the bookings, I operated the kids games, I helped set up and take down carnival rides. I did everything but drive. Uh, and uh, no, it never got bad enough that they had me to drive, but there, you know, I was, <laughs> there were weeks where we thought about it, but you know, it was, <laughs> It just, it just wasn't possible, you know? Um, so, uh, but yeah, you know, so I'm involved in the carnival and me and my, and my dad and my brother, Patrick, we are working to grow the carnival and we're still, we're still struggling. But in 2003, he passed away to lung cancer. And by 2006, we are out of the business. We've sold our rides and we're working on my uncle's carnival midway. Uh, now, my uncle Albert Wagner, he's passed away by now, but his son, Jason Wagner, is still running Wagner's Kitty Carnival. They, si they still call themselves Wagner's Kitty Carnival, even though they got 35 plus rides and they own several billion dollars worth of equipment. You know, it's it's just the name that stuck with them, I guess. It, it, it implies that they're a wholesome family operation, which they are, as opposed to a big time corporate carnival. So I guess it makes some marketing sense. So 
but his son and now his grandsons are in the business. And so we, like I say, we sold our rides. We're on his midway. He doesn't want me to do, to help with the bookings. Uh, my games were never really built to be on a big midway that, you know, they made good money on a small show where there might be four or five games, but not successful on a show where there would be 20 or 30 or some weeks, even 40 different games for people to choose from. So eventually I'm at this point where my game is losing money and my mom is having to take money out of her food trailer in order to buy the stock so I can keep working. And I tell them, I go, look, it, why do I have to be here? And they're like, well, if you're not here, where would you be? I mean, you're, you're part of the family. You need to be on the midway. And I'm like, not if it's not serving any purpose, I don't. So it took, it took the entire season of 2007 or 2008 to finally convince them to let me just stay home and go and work, work completely on helping other people sell their used rides, which is, you know, one of those interesting things as, as our business went out of business, we had these rides that somebody had to sell. So I did it. And then when I realized that my, my, I wasn't going to be able to make money on my uncle's midway. I started a website called the midway marketplace where I still help people sell used rides and games and other related equipment. And, uh, started doing that full time. I filed for the domain name in September of 2007. And the website was finally online in January or February of 2008. But I'm telling you. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, neither did I. My life changing experience with cancer moved me to share my story. You can get my book, Bad Days or Really Good Days in Disguise on Amazon. Click the link below in the description. Now back to the episode. I thought running a carnival was hard. Having an online business as a blind guy, that was, man, I mean, because I had to learn so much stuff. The first thing I had to do was I had to teach myself how to code HTML just to get my website online. So, I mean... Oh man! Just imagine, yeah, just imagine a blind guy with no skills, talent, money, or experience. Uh, this was before WordPress, Facebook, or even Wi-Fi. I mean, just imagine trying to upload a photo to your website so you could advertise a carnival ride on a 56K moto. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. You I have mean, the patience of a saint. What I want to do here is, is I want to bring you forward now so the Midway Marketplace is something that's still in check, but you've become fully equipped at what you're about to take on now. And this is the beginning of your blind blogger in around 2016. Right. So how does blind blogger get started and what does it turn into? Right. Well, I really have to credit my friend, Adrian Smith, who I like to call my blogging mama, who uh, you know, I've been blogging since 2009 for the Midway Marketplace, and she taught me everything I know about uh, the power of commenting on people's work, sharing their content, and building relationships through blog commenting. And so she really helped me grow that first website. And she had been trying to tell me for a couple of years, she's like, Max, there is more to you than selling used carnival junk. And I'm like, uh, I'm nothing special. I'm just a guy who shows up every day and I work my butt off and I try, I'm trying to build a business that will help support the family. And she's finally like, no, Max, that's not how the rest of the world sees you. And so she finally explained to me, so here's the way it works. She said, you have a built-in excuse. If Max decided to sit on his couch and eat, eat junk food and watch TV or listen to the radio, nobody would say nothing about it because you're Max and you're totally blind. But the fact that you show up and take on these difficult challenges anyway, when you have this excuse, is what makes you compelling. And she says, on top of that, you have to realize there are millions of people out there who don't have the same uh, roadblocks that you do, who are not doing anything with their lives. They're sleepwalking through their days. They're not challenging themselves. They're happy with their comfortable existence, even if that comfortable existence is not really all that comfortable to them. So she said the the fact that you have an excuse and don't use it. And so I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need a website. What am I going to call myself? And so I put that out on social media and the immediate response was, Max, we've been calling you the blind blogger as a former shorthand for over two years now. So see if that's available. And the blindblogger.com wasn't, but .net was. And so, you know, here we are. We've, we've started the blindblogger.net. 
And my first post was actually titled, I think I'm ready to be an inspiration, which uh, like I said, it took me a lot to get to that point. And there are some days where I still don't get it, but I, I, I continue to live and work and you know, there's a, there's a great line from Star Trek uh, first, first Contact where the guy says, just be a man and let history worry about the rest. So I just continue to do the work and let them worry about whether I'm inspiration or not. And as a result of the blindblogger.net and the posts I shared and a dare from an online, uh, from an online summit creator, I, I wrote my first book in 2014. I've since written four altogether. Uh, I competed in a, in a writer's competition by Amtrak where I won a trip anywhere in uh, the United States and chose to go by myself to New York City during December and January of 2016-17. I've spoken at conferences. I've sung in public. I started my own podcast, What's Your Excuse? I've been on hundreds of podcasts. You just left your mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Listen to more episodes on demand. Just click Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Be our friend on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Whether jumping out the MP or jumping on the app. You are listening to, listening to Vince Cortez. We just want you to leave your mark. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll love this next guest story. Click the link to watch now. Have a blessed day.